Good morning, everybody. So glad to have you out this morning on this Lord's Day, this special Lord's Day. This begins our gospel meeting with Brother B.J. Clark. <clears throat> Brother B.J. is here, and he informs me that he is ready to go. <clears throat> so we hope that you are too. So without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and start with Brother B.J. Clark. Come on. Well, I want to wish you a very, very good morning and offer my deepest gratitude for the chance to be with you here in this series of meetings. It was my privilege to be here, I know for sure, back in 2010. I've uh, grown a little older since then. I might have been here another time since then, but I couldn't find it in my records. But uh, I know I remember being here, and I remember the opportunity of uh, getting to know some very good people here. I want to thank you before I get started with uh, the messages for this week for your prayers because they're the very reason that I believe my wife is able to be with me this week. Uh, she's still awaiting some biopsy results early this week that were from a biopsy taken last week to see whether uh, the spot that they found is uh, cancerous or not. And then if they determine that it is, they'll decide from that point on what to do next. But uh, we've received cards from this congregation, prayers. Uh, you all have already made us feel at home before we ever got here. So thank you, thank you, thank you so very much for that. That means so, so much to us. You can't go to heaven without it. And so we'd better make sure we possess it and know all about it. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6 for just a moment. This morning as we begin this series of messages that I've entitled, The Faith That Saves. The Faith That Saves. And in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6, we find something that is impossible. The Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In this passage, we see the demand for faith. You cannot please God without faith, but that behooves us to get a definition. What is the definition of faith? And that's what we're going to explore this week. It is basically putting all of your trust in God and forsaking everything else. In fact, it's not original with me, but I remember very vividly hearing the definition of faith taking the letters F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I trust Him. I trust Him. Even when the world thinks that He's not worthy of my trust, I trust Him. Now, what we're going to do this week, Lord willing, is unfold faith, the faith that saves in a number of ways. The faith that saves is the faith that ad admits some things. We're going to look at some of those things in the Bible class. The faith that saves is one that uh, submits to Almighty God. It is a faith that commits, C-O-M-M-I-T-S. And then we're going to see near the very end of the week, the faith that saves is the faith that transmits. It's faith to others. And so that is the overall look at what we're going to be doing this week. But I want to start with what Hebrews eleven six says we must admit. The number one thing we must admit in order to possess faith is found here in Hebrews eleven six. Will you look at it with me? But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, watch, must believe that he is. Do you believe that God is? The Bible says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 28, there is, and we're about to say beyond the azure blue because we sung that song, sung that song so many times. But uh, listen, there is, and that's based, I believe, very much on the book of Daniel. That whole song is based on the book of Daniel. I believe if you look at it carefully, you can see that all throughout the book of Daniel. But there is a God in heaven. I, someone says, 
have you ever seen him? I have not seen him. No man has seen him at any time in the full essence of his glory. Uh, he would not be able to live if he saw God in the full essence of his glory, according to Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 20. But the Bible makes it clear. The Bible makes it clear that we have a, a God in heaven. I know that he is. Now think about it. How, someone says, how do you know that he is? Ed, if I ask you to admit there is a God in heaven, you might say, well, you're first going to have to give me some evidence. Well, let me ask you, would it be hard for you uh, to admit, would it hard for, be, be hard for me to get someone to admit that this phone had a creator, that someone designed it, someone made it, it was deliberately designed and created by human beings in a factory is there anyone who would deny or have any trouble admitting that this phone had a designer and a creator? No one has any trouble admitting that. Let me ask you a question. Put this right next to your, well, I don't know if you should put it right next to your brain or not for any length of time. But I'll tell you this. You put this right beside the human brain and look at the intricacy and complexity. Did you know there is more computing power in the phone that you and I carry in our shirt pockets than there was on the first ship that went to the moon. You have as much computing power in this small device that you carry around in your uh, pocket or in your jacket than you do, than you, they had, that is, when they went to the moon. So this is absolutely a designed product. There's no question about it. So wait a minute, the camera on it, that makes it so much better, we're told, than the previous model. And if you wait just a couple of years, their camera will make this camera look really, really shabby. And you'll need that camera instead of this one. And it always strikes me, the camera on one of these phones is nothing compared to the eye that God created for you and for me. If this had a designer and had to have had a designer, and everyone readily admits and acknowledges, yeah, there's no way the parts that make up a phone could just kaboom into existence and just land in such a way as to be able to produce a phone with the ability to zoom in and zoom out and to take photos. Yeah, that's all just a wonderful lucky happenstance. No, it was done by design and deliberate, and we all know it. We all know it. He that cometh to God must admit, he must believe that he is. There is a God in heaven. I know this because Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4 says something that I know you also will be very readily able to accept. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4, here it is. For every house is builded by some man. Well, stop right there. Who would deny that? I was not present when this structure was built. I don't remember exactly when it was built. I'm pretty sure I could talk to some folks around here that could tell me. When this building came into existence and how long it took approximately to build it and who the construction company was that built it or who the people were involved in building it, all those things are very easily, you know, Information I could very easily find out. So let me ask you, if I bring the world's most renowned atheist into this building, and I say, Mr. Atheist, I just want you to look around, look at the structure, the beams, everything, the placement of the lights, the uh, PowerPoint projector that is pointing apparently with all deliberation and intent at this spot, and then there are other contraptions here that are mounted to the wall that it's almost as if it was they were put there for you to be able to see what's on them that almost seems to have been done deliberately and by design and Mr. Atheist I just want you to look around this building do you see any evidence of deliberation and design what would he have to say well sure if I tell him <clears throat> I know this is hard for you to believe but all the items necessary for that are composed in this building right now, present in this building right now, the light bulbs, everything that is here right now, 
was formerly in a pile in a rubble and a tornado swept through this part of the county and when the tornado passed, voila. All the light bulbs were even screwed in, turned on. No one in their right mind would buy such a thing as that. And yet, you know what you and I are told? That something far more complex than this building came about in just such a fashion that kaboom, there was a big bang. And look at all the design that we got from it. Now, listen, the sky above is what makes me admit that he is. Listen to Psalm 19.1. I know you know it. The heavens do what? They declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. You cannot look into the starry, starry night and not be impressed by the majesty and power of our supreme creator. Those stars, those tiny and twinkling to us, are massive in size. They are millions and millions and millions and even billions of miles and trillions of miles away from where we are located in, depending on which part of the galaxies you're talking about. The very heavens declare the glory of God. They say that he is. They tell us there is a God in heaven. There is no one that has the power to make a star. But almighty God does. No human being has the power. No group of human beings can create a star. But almighty God could and did. And he created so many you don't know how many there are really. And so this is. One of those things that I absolutely know, the sky above makes me admit that he is. The earth beneath makes me admit that he is. Now, I have right here in front of me something that was designed and put here for decorative purposes. I don't think it just got here by accident. Someone deliberately arranged it and put it here so that uh, we could have it just to kind of adorn the place. Makes this area look better when I'm standing here for this to be here. Is there anyone who would say that what's inside of this pot just happened by accident? Anyone that would say none of this was designed, none of this was deliberate? The things that you see manufactured and made here did not really have a manufacturer. They did not really have a maker. They just came into existence by accidental chance and happenstance. I couldn't get anyone in the world to believe that. But the actual plants and flowers upon which this was based, they did come into the world by accidental chance and happenstance. Would say some of the same people who would tell me this could never happen by accident would say the real deal did happen by accident. Friends, you and I know better than that. We know better. The Bible teaches us very clearly that God made this world. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. And then I start going down the days of creation and I can see where all the things on the earth beneath came into existence. And when I see a leaf falling from a tree, I know there had to be a designer of that tree and that that makes me think there is a God in heaven. I know he must be there. So I admit that he is there because of the sky above, because of the earth beneath, because of the body that I see right in front of me. Now, if I were to show you an artificial heart this morning, an artificial heart, there's no one who would believe that artificial heart would just happen by accidental chance and happenstance. No one would say, yeah, the artificial heart had no designer, it had no maker. And yet the real heart that it's patterned after, we're told, did not have a designer or a maker. Friends, how can we be duped into thinking things like that in this world? We must believe that he is, and it's easy to believe that he is. Look at Psalm 139, and this is a, a marvelous thing that I'll never be able to get over, and I don't want to be able to get over it because I'm just in awe every time I contemplate it. 
Psalm 139. What did the psalmist say in Psalm 139 and verse number 14? He said, I will praise thee. Why? For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Look at it. The circulatory system that is in your body, that the blood that keeps you alive, the, the blood the, the heart pumps to keep you alive, that circulatory system in your body, what are the chances that it happened just by random chance and accidental happenstance? No way. We know better than that. Miles and miles of circulatory system are actually inside of your body. When you look at the brain itself, and we've been thinking more and more about the body and its marvelous ability to heal, its marvelous ability to, to adapt to its, it, the needs that it has when other parts of the body are injured. And these kinds of things have been very much on our minds recently. And certainly some of you understand exactly how marvelous it is that God made the body the way he did, where Skin can be taken oftentimes from one part of the body and grafted onto another part of the body to cover up for the skin that used to be there. In 1985, I slam dunked a basketball. And by the way, I, I didn't look then like I look now. That was 1985. I could jump back then. I could jump pretty high. And I slam dunked a basketball. I was a skinny little boy then. And my wedding ring that I was wearing, it was gold in color then, it got caught on one of the loops where the net hooks onto as I was coming down from the dunk and started tugging at this finger and I knew something was going on. I reached up very quickly with my right hand to grab the rim to try to steady myself until I could see what was happening and then I extricated my hand from the loop and realized, oh, that's not supposed to look like that. And my feet, which were not injured at all, started running with great concern. And my head and every part of my body was coming to the aid of the injured location on my body. And certainly I was very, very much interested in coming up with some kind of solution to what I was seeing. And then, long story shorter, we go to the emergency room. The individual takes a look at my finger and says, what are we going to do? And I said, I was hoping you would know the answer to that question. They put me in an ambulance and sent me to Barnes Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri, where they had a hand center there, and they did an operation. And they were able to take skin from this other hand, uh, skin from another part of my hand, actually this hand here, and replace the skin that I'd lost here and then take skin from another part of my body and replace the skin here. How did all of that just so happen to be possible? The God of heaven who made the body made it possible for other parts of the body to assist in the healing of the body. There's no way all of these things just happen randomly and by chance. You can never convince me of that. And if you go to Psalm 139 and look at it more carefully, just think about how easy it is to admit that he is when I see what he's done. Look at verse number 13 of Psalm 139. Thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb, I will praise thee, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. He goes on to describe how God's eyes, verse 16, saw his substance when he was yet unformed, not completely formed. And in thy book, all my members were written. So let me ask you this question. How is it that I got a hard skeleton, a bony structure underneath my skin, when the materials that were involved in me coming into this world from my mom and dad had no hardness to them, tell me how, from the materials involved in my conception, I got a hard and bony skeleton. Tell me how that happened. This is God. 
God made this world and made man and he made it possible for man to be able to reproduce and to have the reproductive process in place. And thus, I give credit to God and admit that he is. There is a God in heaven. The sky above says it. The earth beneath shows it. My body screams it. There is a God in heaven. Stephen Hawking said he didn't believe in God when he was alive. He had this television show, and this one particular intro to his television show always fascinated me because it showed the camera zooming in on his eye. That was the way his sh intro to his show opened. The camera would then zoom in closer and closer and, and go right into the depth of his eye. And I thought to myself, Mr. Hawking, you would never ever in the world, ever in the world admit or say that that camera that's zooming in on your eye just happened by accidental chance and happenstance or evolved over millions and millions and millions and millions of years. But the eye that camera is zooming in on is more equipped and has more ability to see instantly and to focus and to do things that that camera was designed by human beings to do. Who designed the camera in your eye? Who? Carl Sagan was also a well-known astronomer who denied the existence of God was something that had to be admitted. And so he wrote an article for Parade Magazine. I don't even know if they put Parade Magazine out anymore. It used to come in the Sunday paper as a little magazine inside the Sunday paper. But uh, in that Parade Magazine article years ago, Carl Sagan was asked, assigned to write an article if you were in outer space and you had satellite technology and infrared technology to be able to look at Earth from outer space, never having visited Earth, would you be able to know for sure that this Earth had a designer, or excuse me, that it had intelligent life on it was the thing he was asked to determine. Does this earth have intelligent life on it? Would you be able to determine that from outer space if you'd never visited earth? You know what he, you know what he did? He put pictures in there of the Washington, D.C. highway system and how satellite photography, even from outer space, could take pictures and show the design of the streets and how they intersected by design and the headlights on the cars. And he said in his article that this would be presumptive evidence of intelligent life on Earth. That you could look from outer space at this satellite picture and say, hmm, the organizational structure of these roads and these lights that seem to be appearing all over on these roads is presumptive evidence there must be intelligent life on earth. I could not help but then wonder and say, all right, Mr. Sagan, if you from outer space could see that and determine there's, yeah, got to be intelligent life on earth, who put the intelligence in those people who had the wisdom to know how to build a highway system, who know how to build a car and to build it with lights, who put the intelligence into them? There had to be someone with intelligence that imparted that intelligence unto those individuals. Who did it? He that cometh to God must believe that he is. And there is a God in heaven, and I'm so thankful today to affirm, yes, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I know he's there. I know he's there. I went to the St. Louis Science Center with an elder who was a friend of mine that uh, I was preaching there at the time in South Haven, Mississippi. We went to see a ball game at night, but during the day we had some time, so we went to the St. Louis Science Center. I like true science. My wife has been at times a science teacher in the school system, and so I am not anti-science in any way, shape, or form. At this science center, they had a lot of fascinating exhibits. And uh, what I noticed, though, so many of these exhibits were touting evolution as the explanation 
for what I was seeing or for what they were displaying. And I just kept thinking, why, 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 why? Won't people just come out and admit there is a God in heaven? Why won't they admit that he is? Well, more about that in a moment. But I came around the corner and there was a blank wall except for, I would say, nine video monitors that were mounted side by side on that wall. And if you looked at, uh, if you were standing here from left to right, the far left monitor had pictures, fast frame fashion pictures of the uh, equipment that was clearing the land, the, knocking down the trees, clearing the land, laying the slab for the building, the St. Louis Science Center building. Then the next video would show them working on this part of the building, showed the men in their hard hats, and they're working, they're digging, they're doing, and you just followed each monitor until you got to the very last monitor, and there was the ribbon-cutting ceremony the absolute celebration of the St. Louis Science Center's grand opening. And there it was. If you just watched the video from left to right, you would see the visual truth of how the St. Louis Science Center came into existence. It's right there for everyone to see. You know, it struck me that if I'd never visited and watched those videos, you still wouldn't have to convince me that someone built it of course, someone built it. Buildings don't build themselves. That's why the Hebrews 3, 4 passage that I mentioned earlier is so significant. For every house is built by some man. And I've never, ever wanted to leave graffiti in my life anywhere except that day in the St. Louis Science Center. I wanted to paint on the blank wall above the monitors, for every house is built by some man. And then underneath that put, but he that built all things is God. Because here you see it, and just as the St. Louis Science Center had to have a builder, had to have designers and builders, he that built all things is God. According to these folks, the St. Louis Science Center had builders and designers, but the ones who built the St. Louis Science Center had no builders, had no designers. Come on. Come on. I tell a story every now and then that I admit, Frank, freely is absolutely silly. I'll tell you one reason I keep telling it. I went to a hold a meeting recently, and this young man came up to me. He says, you remember the last time you were here, you told about that cake? I said, yeah, you remember the cake? I said, always remember that cake, young man. He said, I remember the cake. I want you to imagine that you come in, young people, to your kitchen, and there on the counter is your very favorite cake, baked, frosted with your very favorite frosting, and has your name written across the top of it. You track down mom, and you say, Mom, thank you so much for baking my favorite cake. And your mom says, I love you dearly, but I have no idea what you're talking about. I didn't bake you a cake. Well, there's a cake on the kitchen counter with my name on it. Well, honey, that's, that's not me. If my wife told our children that she didn't bake the cake, I can promise you they wouldn't come running to me and say, Daddy, thank you for baking us a cake. Some men are quite capable of doing that. I'm not one of those men that would be very good at it. So let's say, though, you are good at it. And they say, Daddy, thank you for baking my favorite cake. And you say, I love you dearly but I didn't bake you a cake. Mama didn't bake it. Daddy didn't bake it. Your brother or sister, do they love you enough to bake you a cake? Maybe so, but they said, no, we didn't do that. Well, the cake is here. Yeah. It had to come from somewhere. Yeah. Where did it come from? Dad calls a family meeting. He said, I've got this thing figured out. I've I really been studying this, and I, I think I've got this nailed. While we were away on our trip, there must have been quaking and shaking going around in this neighborhood, and a mixing bowl must have started working its way out of one of the cabinets. 
And a particularly violent shake caused that mixing bowl to fall, but it landed, fortunately for us, right side up, ready to receive ingredients needed for a cake. At some point in time, there must have been such a violent thrust of this building that a gas main exploded and kaboom, the refrigerator door came flying open and eggs came flying out. And of all the place in the whole kitchen, the eggs could have gone. Aren't we lucky? They just so happened to smash on the cabinet right above the mixing bowl and drip into the mixing bowl, but somehow none of the eggshell got in there. Wonderful. Somehow all the ingredients necessary for the baking of a cake, come kaboom, an explosion caused a a collision of ingredients and all those ingredients of all the places they could have landed in the kitchen landed in the mixing bowl. Daddy, even if that happened, how did it get from the mixing bowl into a cake pan, into the oven? Well, young people, whenever you can't explain how something happened, kaboom, an explosion explains everything. There was an explosion. At which time, the cake pan comes hurtling out of its location. The mixing bowl is rocketing toward the cake pan. They collide, and the cake pan lands on the kitchen floor. The mixing bowl is now upside down, emptying its contents into the cake pan. Daddy, cakes don't bake themselves sitting on the kitchen floor in a cake pan with a mixing bowl right smack dab in the middle of it. How did it get into the oven? Did you not hear what I said earlier? Whenever you can't explain how something really sophisticated and, and technical happened, kaboom, an explosion happened, and there was a separation of the cake pan and the mixing bowl. Oven door comes flying open, cake pan goes flying in. Daddy, who turned on the oven? Oh, yeah, about that. Earth quaking, shaking. Mason jar above the oven, one of the cabinets above the oven, starts working its way out. It's falling. It knocks the knob and turns it into the bake setting. Isn't that good? And then another mason jar knocks the temperature knob of all the temperatures it could have accidentally knocked it to. Fortunately for us, it knocked it to just the temperature needed to bake a cake. Daddy, even if all that happened, who took the cake out of the oven and cake? kept it from becoming a burnt crisp at just the right moment when the cake was just perfect. Kaboom! There's an explosion. Here comes the cake flying out of the oven. Here comes the frosting flying out of the refrigerator. They collide. The frosting smothers the cake. I don't know yet how it wrote your name on it. I'm still working on that part of it. But I know the cake came into existence in just that way. That's how it happened, boys and girls. It landed on the kitchen counter. And... Daddy, who cleaned up the mess? And Mama, do you want to call 911 or should one of us kids call 911? Daddy has lost his mind. Is there anyone listening to me now or ever who would hear that story and think, sounds reasonable? No. That's malarkey, as they used to say, right? That's just absolute silliness. Okay, well, if a cake has to have a baker, then man has to have what? A maker. Cakes don't bake themselves. Men don't kaboom into existence just out of accidental chance and happenstance. It was all done deliberately and by design. The faith that saves admits that he is. But why then are so, so many people reluctant to admit that he is? I want you to go to Romans 1 and you'll see what we find in this passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 1. There, we really are without excuse. There is no reason for not believing in God. There's no justifiable reason for not believing in God. Romans 1 says as much. In verse number 18, we read, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. 
For the, watch this, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, the sky, the earth, the body, are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. There's, it would be inexcusable for me to look at this monitor and say, I don't believe anyone made it. It just happened by accident. And you would think I was silly if I just wouldn't back down from that, wouldn't you? Friends, God gave me, he gave you evidence of his existence. So then why do some people not admit that he exists? Watch it. Because that when they knew God, verse 21, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became what? Because the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14, 1, Psalm 53, 1. And then the Bible says, these individuals, verse 28, did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And so God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Do you know there are atheists on record, evolutionists on record as admitting, yes, we know the evidence is there for a designer, for God. But if we admit that, then we have to listen to what he says and we don't want to be governed by anyone but ourselves. So we choose to believe the impossible, that out of nothing came everything. That's what they've said. Friends, the first step in your faith journey to get you to heaven is to, number one, believe that he is. That is what the Bible says. It is what you and I must believe. And so that's step one. Believe that he is. If you believe that, then you're ready to listen to what he says about this world and what you and I need to believe about this world and about the Christ. And so I want to say to you as a close out, there is a God in heaven. Let us not be ashamed to affirm that he's there.